Halo 3 ODST is a game of contradictions. It's a Halo game that ditches 90% of the things that the Halo franchise had for the last decade become known for. Wide open environments on a strange alien world. Gone. The Master Chief and his rechargeable shield. Gone. Galactic stakes and operatic drama. Gone. Big orchestral music. Gone. ODST is a deviation from everything that anyone would tell you are the things that make Halo great. And what was the result? The best game in the entire series. ODST was made towards the end of Bungie's tenure as the creators of Halo, and while Reach was to be their big send-off, ODST is something entirely different and experimental. Using their relative obscurity and creative freedom that a spin-off provides to take the franchise in a direction contrary to what a proper sequel needs to. A sequel needs to capture the same spirit as what came before, a spin-off just has to be roughly connected to the original. ODST is still a branch that would be followed, but not by Halo. Instead, in ODST we can see the beginning of Bungie's path after Halo. The beginnings of Destiny and the strange limited open world design that has defined Bungie for this last decade. ODST is the grandfather of Destiny much more than any other Halo game. In case it wasn't clear yet, ODST is my favourite Halo game and, point of fact, one of my favourite games of all time. It just has this vibe that, no, no, I refuse. Once again, I am truly nostalgia brainwormed when it comes to this game, to the point where I find it way, way too easy to gloss over this game's flaws, which I know it does have. But we're at the point now where this game isn't just an important part of my childhood, but an important part of my identity as a kid. I love this game so much that this isn't even the first time I'm making this video. This is a remake of an old video I did to fit better within this whole retrospective series that I'm doing. But I will try. I can only promise to try and stay rational here. Halo 3 ODST is part of a very specific subgenre of games. The Shared Engine spin-off. ODST uses the same engine and a lot of the same assets as Halo 3. Same guns, same vehicles, same enemies, almost identical gameplay. It's closer to an extra big DLC expansion than it is to a full new game, and you can put as much or as little venom on that statement as you want. For me, I've always wished that more games were made this way because they always result in really interesting and creative games like Far Cry Primal or Fallout New Vegas or Borderlands the sequel. Games that don't have to reinvent the wheel and can therefore take the core mechanics of the original game and take them in weirder, more experimental directions. These games all share the same critique, that because they're so similar to the original games, they're cheaper to make and shouldn't be sold at full price. This is a critique that views these games as products and not as art, an argument that becomes less and less relevant as we get further away from the original launch day and the price becomes less and less relevant. For what it's worth, the developers would agree that the game was overpriced. They had originally intended to sell it at half the price of a normal game, but then Microsoft pushed them to sell it as a full price game, much to their annoyance. But 14 years later, when you can get the entire game for $5 as DLC for another game, I think that marketing lens is much less valid. I think the concept is a creatively compelling one. Let's take the same core gameplay as Halo 3 and the same roster of enemies and put them in an entirely new context. To some people, just doing that isn't enough to constitute a full new game, but just because ODST looks like Halo 3 graphically doesn't mean it's not doing anything new. ODST takes massive experimental shifts in design from the trilogy that a full sequel just wouldn't allow for. Because of time constraints, budget constraints, and the marketing constraints that say a sequel has to be at least similar to the games that came before. So sure, from a strictly consumerist perspective, ODST isn't a full game, whatever you define that as. It's got Halo 3 in the title, it's not trying to disguise the fact that it's a spin-off. But once you look beyond that, you find a game that is so much more creatively interesting than Halo 3 is on its own. The Navy put up a good fight. Of course they did. It's Earth. Better late than never. How about you show some respect, Romeo? Just saying, Dutch. They missed one. No. They left it for us. You know the music. Time to dance. Despite being called Halo 3 ODST, the game actually takes place during the events of Halo 2, during the Covenant's invasion of Mombasa. 
While the chief is tearing up the streets, a team of orbital drop shock troopers, or ODSTs, are planning an infiltration mission on the carrier hovering over the city. ODSTs are a kind of special forces in Halo, first introduced in Halo 2. They're tougher than your average marine and enter into the fight by deploying in these drop pods that launch them immediately into the fight. But they're not super soldiers, which is one of the biggest mechanical and tonal differences between ODST and the rest of the series. The ODSTs are very, very human in comparison to Master Chief, and that is something the game highlights immediately. Especially since, for some reason, this game is a secret reunion of beloved sci-fi western Firefly with three of the main cast as part of the squad, and their banter is so natural. The squad are built on the archetypes you'd expect, the typical five-man band approach, which is a trope, but also generally the best way to structure a team of heroes. We've got the leader, Edward Buck, as portrayed by Nathan Fillion, doing his usual Nathan Fillion thing. Uh, did I do something wrong? Because the only thing I regret about you and me not knowing you were a spook when we first met. I would have been a lot less charming. Our big guy is Dutch, as played by Adam Baldwin, and he forms a comedy double act with the smart guy, Mickey, as played by Alan Tudyk, rounding our Firefly reunion. My vote, hold up, wait for backup. Thank God! Does one of you know how to use explosives? Your vote? Just got overruled. Oh. Then we have our Lancer, Romeo, the back-talking sniper, as voiced by, oh hey look, it's Nolan North again. But this time, he's doing a black guy impression. What the hell am I supposed to do with this inside a Covenant ship? I, uh, have nothing else to say about that, it's just a bit weird, isn't it? And finally, there's the Rookie, your player character, a silent, nameless protagonist in a way that not even Master Chief is. But it's a little more complicated than just being a faceless avatar, which we'll get into later. Wake up, Buttercup. Relax, Rookie. He don't mean nothing. Besides, now's one of those times. It pays to be the strong, silent type. For this mission, the squad are to be put under the command of Veronica Dare, an operative for the Office of Naval Intelligence, or ONI. Basically, the space CIA, who also happens to be a former romantic partner of Buck. I'll pass on that dance, but you can show me where to sit. Already, this is about ten times as much character stuff and interconnected dynamics than the trilogy ever tried. This is part of the game's more human framework. These guys aren't the Greek hero that is Master Chief. They're just soldiers. They bicker, they joke, and they look out for each other in a dangerous place. This also transitions into one of the most iconic openings in the series, dropping your pod in real time. First passing by the wreckage of the Navy, then through the cloud layer to the ship and the city below. During the drop, Dare changes the trajectory of your squad, way off course of the target, but she has a mission of her own. However, just at that moment, the cruiser makes the jump to slip space, sending out an EMP blast that scatters the squad across the city and knocks the rookie out cold for most of the day. The rest of the game plays out with Rookie exploring the war-torn streets hunting for clues as to what happened to the squad. As he finds these clues, we switch to one of the squad members and play through the events of the day from their perspective. It's a really interesting framing device, and I've never seen another shooter attempt something quite like it. The story is Rookie's, you're tied to his perspective, but with these missions you uncover parts of the mystery at the same time he does. And there is a genuinely interesting mystery to uncover, another rarity for an FPS, and not something Halo has ever attempted before. Following along with the franchise, the setup is also a massive break in the formula. The game is essentially a limited open world game with linear missions within it. The framework of both the original game and especially the port to the Master Chief Collection kind of disguises that by classing Mombasa Streets as a mission alongside the rest of the missions, but in reality the stormy streets of Mombasa are more of a hub world than an actual mission. There is a linear order to things and the game points you that way, but you can actually collect the clues and play the missions in any order if you really want to. This is pretty much exactly the same as the patrol areas that Destiny is built around, wide open spaces that you can access linear missions within, along with some secrets to find. And of course, the thing that has become Bungie's crown jewel, absolutely incredible art direction and environmental storytelling. Keep 
14 years on, this game is starting to show its age, no doubt. But what makes this game timeless is the excellent sense of place it provides. The dimly lit streets of New Mombasa, rain washing away the blood of the battles that had been fought during the day, the raging fires in the distance illuminating the stormy sky in an unnatural orange glow. Enemies are sparse, mostly search parties on the hunt for survivors, like you. The place feels dead in a way that the crumbling streets of Halo 2 or 3 never did. And that's because the new Mombasa of ODST feels so real, it feels lived in. There's so much intricate detail put into the streets of New Mombasa, it feels like a genuine city and not just a level in a video game. The whole place feels desperately cramped, you can feel in every corner that millions of people used to live here. There's broken down cars everywhere, graffiti on the walls touting the end of time. You explore people's homes, offices, the quiet parks locked away between buildings that would have once served as an escape from the hustle and bustle of the city. The Covenant's constructions of purple and blue feel more alien than they ever have contrasted against the futuristic and yet entirely human cityscape. The Covenant themselves feel more dangerous than ever before, the brutes tower over the human architecture, they tower over you. The grunts, tiny cannon fodder since the first game, seem a lot scarier when they're the same size as you. The primary driver of all this is simple. The game wants you to feel alone, in a very genuine, darkly beautiful way. All of the Halo games are beautiful, but ODST is beautiful in a very different way. It's not pretty visuals of completely alien terrains, it's the melancholy emptiness of the mundane and familiar. A space age police car is still just a police car. Someone, some random average person, worked these streets, and now they're nowhere to be seen. The streets of New Mombasa are soul-crushingly human in a way Halo has never been before. Halo is ultimately a very silly sci-fi setting with a whole lot of weird sci-fi nonsense, but ODST makes it feel so much more real. Yes, this is a crazy universe with ancient aliens and super soldiers and big rings that can destroy all life in the universe and a crazy alien cult that wants to do that because they're crazy, but it's got real people in it too. Real people who get held up in traffic on their way to work. Real people who take romantic strolls around these hidden nooks of nature. Real people who pile their rubbish up in the alley behind the office. Real people who are already gone by the time you arrive, but that you can feel the ghosts of everywhere you look. This is all perfectly enhanced by the game's score. It's got a completely different sound from every other game in the series, with a soft, jazzy rhythm that plays as you explore the city. It's the perfect vibe. It evokes the feeling of a jazz bar at closing time. You were waiting for a girl there, but she never came. Probably never had any intention of showing up in the first place. You should have left hours ago, but the rain is pouring outside and the beer's on tap. The performer did his set for the day, now he's just kind of freestyling it in the corner as the last customers trickle out for the night. It's the kind of vibe that should be completely out of place in a big action FPS game, but it works flawlessly. It perfectly enhances the game world and the overarching feeling of loneliness and melancholy. I think this is why I'm okay with the silent protagonist in this game. In almost every game with a silent protagonist, the fact that the main character never speaks is never addressed and is really jarring. People talk at you, they don't talk to you, and your player character, even if they're named, never feels like an actual character, they're just the avatar that you're controlling to see the story. Stories with a silent protagonist tend to be about larger, more grandiose topics, focusing less on the individual and more on the big picture storytelling. I still think most of these stories would benefit from a talking protagonist, but that's by the by. ODST is not a grandiose story, in many ways it's not the sort of story that should have a silent protagonist. And yet, the silent protagonist works perfectly, because the choice to keep the Ricky silent feels like a genuine creative decision and not a cop out to writing a main character, like it does in a lot of silent protagonist games. For starters, when you jump into the other squad mate's shoes, they talk constantly, way more than any Halo game previously. Even Master Chief and the Arbiter only talk during cutscenes. But the key there is that the squad mates have someone to talk to, be it the local military resistance or each other. Rookie has no one to talk to, and so there's no reason for him to talk. Having Rookie monologue would ruin the lonely atmosphere of the game world. He's alone with just his thoughts, as are you. The fact that he doesn't talk even when people are around feels like a creative choice built on the fact that after hours of silence it would be really strange to hear him speak. 
But the writers haven't treated him like a player in Sir Avatar. He may be a silent, faceless suit of armour, but you feel like there's a character in there somewhere. Someone who's inquisitive, someone who's brave, someone who likes naps. Very relatable. He's a silent protagonist, not a characterless one. When he does show up in cutscenes, generally the fact that he never talks becomes part of the joke, like the scene where Buck and Dare are arguing while Rookie tries to get their attention in the background, but, you know, he can't talk. I think the fact that he doesn't speak works on a symbolic level too. The Rookie isn't Master Chief, he isn't a big hero, he isn't trying to be one. His only goal is to find his squad. He doesn't need a voice because he could be anyone. He isn't individually important in the grand scheme of things. And there's our theme of loneliness again. The Rookie isn't completely alone in the night though. It seems as though one of the ghosts is helping him along. In a final touch of atmospheric brilliance, the city itself isn't quite dead after all. In fact, it seems to be trying to help you. There are three intertwined mysteries that you're trying to solve in this game. What happened to your squad? Where are they now? What was Dare's actual mission? Why did she divert course from the cruiser? Who is helping you? And what are they trying to tell you? The first one is quite simple and is explained through the missions where you place them throughout the day. They were split up, they helped some of the local military forces before regrouping and escaping the city in a stolen phantom, assuming that the rookie and Dare were dead. The missions where you figure out what happened to the squad are the more traditional Halo FPS parts of the game. Since the rest of the squad was around during the day, their missions take place during the peak of the action and the fighting. A lot of these levels take place in the same places that Rookie then walks through later, finding the remnants of the battles that took place there. But the contrast between this smoky daylight and rainy darkness means that running through the same area feels completely different. And in fact, knowing that just a few hours ago this place was the scene of an epic battle and now it's all completely abandoned only enhances that feeling of loneliness. Dare's actual mission and the mysterious person helping you are one and the same. New Mombasa is partly run by an artificial intelligence called the Superintendent that runs the day-to-day -day things like traffic lights, security cameras, making sure the street lights turn on and off at the right time, reporting incidents, that sort of thing. Dare was sent to extract information that the Superintendent had supposedly discovered about the Covenant's motivations in occupying New Mombasa. You may then assume that it's the superintendent helping Rookie later in the night, but that's actually not quite the case. For one thing, the superintendent isn't a full AI, it's not self-aware, it's more like a highly advanced algorithm. Plus, as revealed during some of the missions, the superintendent was damaged early in the Covenant's attack, which has been a massive pain for the local military. You don't actually have to solve this if you don't care, but there are some things that will seem a bit random if you don't. This mystery is tied to the game's collectibles, which are probably my favourite collectibles in any video game for how they're integrated into the main game's story. As you explore the city, you'll hear ringing phones, cash machines spewing money, med stations beeping, car alarms going off, and signs directing you off the beaten path. And if you investigate them, you'll slowly uncover the game's second secret story with an entirely new cast. It's the story of Sadie and Shedda and her day in New Mombasa when the Covenant arrived. At first, these are another mystery. Obviously, your mysterious helper wants you to hear this story, but it's not really clear why. However, as you listen, you begin to understand. Sadie is the daughter of the man who built the superintendent, and within it he designed a subroutine specifically to watch over his daughter which he named Virgil. Virgil actually does appear to be a full AI and has access to all of the superintendent's systems which are used to help Sadie throughout the story, which in present day it's using to help the rookie. Bizarrely, Sadie's story is a rough retelling of Dante's Inferno, with Sadie as Dante being guided through the nine circles of hell by Virgil, each arc of the story representing a different circle of hell. In the original story, each circle is a place where a specific sin or crime is punished, and as Sadie moves deeper into the city, she meets people and situations that reflect each circle. For example, in Circle 3, she meets an incredibly overweight man giving away food to refugees because he knows he won't be able to escape the city. This is a parallel to the third circle of hell, which is a place where those who indulged in the sin of gluttony are punished. For the last time, move your fat ass! Hey! Get off my car! My friend, I am an 800 pound man with a large cleaver who kills animals every day and chops them into pieces. <laughs> Do you really want us to be enemies? Or would you rather have a nice kebab? This parallel actually extends to Rookie's story as well. ODSTs are sometimes referred to as Hell Jumpers, and many times throughout the game, Hell is used to refer to the situation in New Mombasa. And of course, Rookie is also being guided through the city by Virgil. So, uh, 
Why? I mean, I'm all for literary allegories, but why the Inferno? The Divine Comedy, of which the Inferno is just the first third, is, as far as I can tell, I'm not much for 14th century Italian poetry myself, an allegory for the soul's journey towards God. The Inferno, specifically, is all about the rejection of sin and the various examples of punishment within Hell. Is Halo 3 ODST an allegory for rejecting sin and embracing the light of heaven? I don't think so. What exactly is God in this analogy? The punishment for sins is also not consistent across Sadie's story. Some of them, like Circle 4, Greed, where an old crone starts robbing a bank, are punished by being murdered by the Covenant. But others, like the overweight butcher, aren't punished. In fact, he's one of the most sympathetic characters in the whole story. The strangest one is Circle 8, the circle reserved for those who commit fraud. Sadie and her friend Meg meet a man who's broadcasting war propaganda across the city, talking about how the local militia is fighting back and winning against the Covenant, telling total lies about how the invasion is actually going. Mike is super pissed about this, but when the guy explains his reasons, it paints him in a more sympathetic light. He knows that everyone listening to his broadcasts at this point is going to die. People who are old, sick, or trapped with no hope of escape. And he's just trying to give them hope in their last moments. It's dark and it's depressing, but the guy's not evil for doing it, and ultimately, he isn't punished for it either. If all of the sins were punished as they are in the original story, then it would be a cleaner allegory. Likewise, if all of the sins were subversions of the original story that point out a nuance that Dante's heavy-handed Christian philosophy doesn't allow for, then that too would be clear. The problem is that it's neither. Some of sins have nuance, some don't. So what's the allegory trying to say? I'm not sure. But when looking into how this allegory happened, I found a quote by Joe Staten, the lead writer, who basically gave his reasons as, I just thought it'd be kinda neat. And yeah, that tracks. It is kinda neat, right? To say that this shooter is a loose adaptation of Dante's Inferno. But beyond being a sweet literary reference, I struggle to find any deeper meaning in it. Maybe if I was a Christian, I would find something there that resonated with me. But I'm not, and I don't. Anyway, regardless of allegory, Sadie's story is really great, totally different from any kind of story that Halo has told before. A story of complete powerlessness, following a regular person as they attempt to escape a city under siege, using only their wit and a little luck. Since it's another story taking place during the same day, there's some loose ties to the main story. Like how it's revealed that the idiot who woke up the hive during the mission in the Oni base was actually the villain of Sadie's story, the corrupt police commissioner Kinsler. References to Sadie's story can be found all around the city. You can find set pieces referred to in it, just as you can find the same battlegrounds your squad mates were in. It's just really cool. It's what makes this game stand out even among similar story-heavy FPS games. Everything feels so interconnected, like a tangled web you can map if you're looking hard enough, just like the city itself. Another part of the story is that when Virgil and the superintendent were damaged in the attack, a group of Covenant aliens seemingly tried to repair it. These new aliens are called Engineers, or Huragok. The Engineers are basically living computers, and unlike the other Covenant species, they're non-hostile towards the player. Their support, they provide shields for the Covenant. It's explained that they're basically a slave race of the Covenant, exploited for their intelligence by having explosives strapped around them. Apparently, they were originally planned to be in Halo 1, but were cut because they couldn't get them to work properly. Their design is great, more alien than any of the humanoid covenant, more like an animal than a person, but weirdly cute almost when you see them up close. During the attack, seven engineers defected from the covenant and tried to fix the superintendent, knowing that it held information that could help them defeat the covenant. They were discovered, and so six of them sacrificed themselves, removing the explosives from one so that it could hide while the rest died. During the repair process, this final engineer accidentally merged with the AI Virgil, and began helping Sadie in the same way that Virgil had been, and later, helping you. You don't need to know all of this for the game's story, but it adds so much if you take the time to investigate. Especially since if you do, and a little touch that I love, some scenes change if you know more information. When you've solved the mystery of your squad, you hear Dare over the radio, not dead after all, asking anybody alive to descend below ground and help her on her mission. Along the way, you meet a random police officer. It's the first NPC you meet during your time as rookie, so it's natural that you'll feel quite attached. If you haven't heard Sadie's story, then meeting this random guy down here is super strange and seemingly pointless as he's eventually taken away by the drones as you descend further down. But if you've heard the tale, he lives, eventually making it to sub-level 9, the site where the police commissioner murdered Sadie's dad by overloading the environment system and freezing him to death. 
As it so happens, the ninth circle of hell is a frozen wasteland reserved for those who have committed treachery. Which doesn't bode well for a friendly policeman, now does it? Friendly policeman was sent down here to confirm Sadie's father's death and also kill the engineer. After explaining this to you, he attacks you, making him one of the only hostile humans in the franchise. It's a great little reward for following Sadie's story, a direct tie to the rookie's own journey. Especially since the computer keeps trying to warn you that this guy is no good. And you even meet him arguing with the computer who's locked him out of going forward until you arrive. What's wrong with you, Virgil? You trying to get me killed? Warning, hitchhikers may be escaped convicts. Glad you were here. We needed the help. The scene of finally meeting Virgil in person changes too. Instead of the sceptical and confused Rookie, Rookie whistles to Virgil and greets him like a friend. After all, he knows what you now know, that Virgil was helping him this whole time. The last mission takes place in the early hours of a new day. It's quiet at first, but as the mission goes on, the action intensifies. The full force of the Covenant is arriving, and it's time to get out with your new friend. After a long vehicle segment along the highway and a hold down at the end of the road, the most intense action in the game. You escape the city on the stolen Phantom as the city burns underneath. What can I say? It was a hell of a night. There's one final reveal, one that isn't too hard to guess, but it's a nice connection. The secret that Virgil found, the thing that the Covenant are after, is of course the portal to the Ark buried beneath the city. And good old Sergeant Johnson comes in to have a chat about it. Good. Don't worry. I know what the alien's like. Is he gonna fuck that alien? The Halo trilogy ultimately seeks to be a power fantasy. The war against the Covenant is looking bleak, but Master Chief can and will single-handedly save the day with his badassity. You are still an unstoppable killing machine in ODST, no doubt, but the game makes you work a lot harder for it. Because ODST's goal is to give you a fresh perspective on this entire conflict. The game's creative vision is to make you feel powerless and alone, but not in, like, a depressing way, in a way that recontextualizes the series. Those generic marines that die by the hundreds across the trilogy, this is their story. To achieve this, the game strips you of a lot of the power you've come to expect in a Halo game. Regenerating health and shields are gone. The loss of shields is easily the biggest change to how you play ODST. Being reckless and running in head first can and will get you killed in this game. You can take a couple of hits before you start taking damage, but sustained attacks will chip away at your health bar quickly. And with no regenerating health, you can end up in a downward spiral if you can't find a health pack. If you're coming straight from Halo 3, there's actually a bit of an adjustment period required to realise how frail you are compared to that game, and how much more carefully you have to play. Every bullet you take matters in ODST in a way it just doesn't in any other Halo game. Your default weapons, the silenced SMG and Magnum, feel so small compared to the weapons Master Chief uses. Technically, they're actually really powerful, but they feel quiet and small. Power weapons and heavy vehicles are much rarer until the last mission, and so they feel extra beefy, even if the balance of enemies hasn't changed at all from Halo 3. These changes to the game's balance make the ODSTs feel so much more human than Master Chief in a purely mechanical sense. It's not perfect, you're still way stronger than a regular human has any right to be, capable of punching tanks to death and carrying around heavy turrets, things which I strongly think should have been limited for this game, but overall, the feeling still comes through. I think it's best summarised in a cutscene, actually. At the end of one of the flashbacks, the squad is attacked by a brute chieftain. Now, these guys are a dime a dozen across Halo 3. You kill about two of them per mission, minimum. But here, it takes all four of them, one of them being seriously injured in the process, to take it down. When you take away the invincible badassness of a Spartan, the scale and brutality of the Covenant becomes so much more impactful. There's one gameplay element which I both love and hate, and that's the visor. The visor is your replacement for the flashlight, a sort of faux night vision. It's extraordinarily useful, it highlights enemies, even invisible enemies, as well as the collectibles. During Ricky's parts of the game, there's basically no reason to ever turn it off. Except for the fact that it covers all of the amazing art in a neon green filter. So you can turn it off, but at that point you're just making the game harder for yourself just to see prettier colours. 
These game rebalances aren't really what makes this game so bold compared to the rest of the franchise. What makes it bold is the change in scope and design priorities. The game's intense focus on the city of New Mombasa in all aspects. Halo had become known for its exotic locales, wide open ice canyons, ancient alien megastructures, massive multi-leveled outdoor environments. ODST is so tight by comparison, even the levels which give you a tank are really compact. You're supposed to feel trapped in this city, the massive towers and labyrinthine streets boxing you in like a rat in a maze. In fact, the most open level in the game, Uplift Reserve, is literally a zoo, boxed in on all sides with you looking for an exit. The game's level design has more in common with Arkham City than it does with other Halo games, but the condensed streets and smaller environments allow for the details to take centre stage in a way they never have in previous Halo games. Every time I play this game I notice new tiny details. These bodies of elites you find playing as Buck. When you come back later as Rookie they've been moved and piled up in the corner, barricaded away. There's actually several dead elites you can find around the map. Not a single living elite, but just ominous foreshadowing for the events of Halo 2. In one of the hidden away courtyards you can find an empty drop pod and on your own piece together that based on the location it's probably Mickey's. When playing through the squad mission, sometimes screens will glitch and flash a bunch of cryptic stuff, but if you finish the story you can clearly see that it's Virgil trying to tell the squad what their real mission is. Sometimes when the visor is active you can see strange glowing symbols on the walls, often next to dead elites which the wiki tells me is engineer writing. These are never explained as far as I can tell, but I love the implication that it was the engineers who piled up those bodies, leaving notes of mourning that only they can see. In that same engineer writing, you can often see the symbol for the superintendent among the other alien symbols. These engineers are being forced to fight against you, but between themselves, they know that the superintendent is one of their own and they're trying to help you in whatever limited way they can. Like the caches of weapons that unlock as you find the audio logs, that are also full of this engineer writing. The implication being that they've been sneaking off to gather some equipment for you. Due to the events of Sadie's story, Virgil doesn't trust cops, voila, lat, shown when he's blocking the traitor cop in the tunnels towards the end of the game, but also during the only base mission when he won't allow the police officer to activate the detonator. Come on, Super, unlock the keypad! Even please respect public property. The interconnected storytelling is so compelling, even on multiple replays as you catch more and more connections between the various threads of the plot. The legacy of ODST is an interesting one. It's certainly remembered fondly, especially the soundtrack, but Halo has never really tried anything like it again. The characters have gone on, Buck appears again in Halo 5 now as a Spartan, and the rest of the squad are dealt with in a book, where they kill off my precious boy in a book! How dare, quite frankly. Reach definitely tries to recapture the squad vibe, but it's debatable if it succeeds in that or not. And Halo Infinite is another open world game, but it's drawing from a very different creative pool than ODST. The vibe and the idea of that compact cityscape. Halo's never tried anything like it again. And maybe that's for the best. I don't know that you could recapture the magic that makes this game what it is. ODST is so specifically tied to this point and this place in the Halo universe. It's what gives it that specific noir tone. You couldn't just take these characters and place them in a new environment and call it ODST 2. As much as I love these characters, they're not what makes this game what it is. It's that strange, genius choice to combine futuristic FPS with a noir mystery that makes this game what it is. The kind of strange combination that only makes sense in a spin-off game, and I love it for that. ODST is full of soul. According to Joe Staten, ODST was the most fun they ever had making a Halo game. The game was put together in just 14 months, much shorter than any other Halo game and with a much smaller team. But that's the strength of this kind of game. With the foundations already in place, creativity reigns supreme. So I don't necessarily want ODST 2 but I do want more games that are made like it. The AAA industry is in a bit of a crisis right now and I think games like ODST could be the answer. Halo 3 is a fantastic game and a perfect end to that trilogy, but Halo 3 ODST is a masterpiece all on its own and there's nothing else quite like it.
you for watching, and a very special thank you to my wonderful patrons for your continued support. If you'd like to see your name up here, or get access to Patreon exclusive videos, or just support the things that I do, then please consider signing up. And if you're so inclined, then liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing would also be extraordinarily helpful. We're deep into the Halo series retrospective now, so to check out the entire playlist of Halo retrospectives, click on this playlist up here. Or hey, I mentioned this video is a remake, right? So if you want to check out the original, which I've now delisted, but if you're deeply curious, then you can click down here to see all the ways that this video has now been improved.